By my clock, I have 3.30. So Robin, are you ready? Yep. And Renee, are you okay? Yep. Okay. So everybody online, thank you so much for joining us today um, at Hatfield's research seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt and I'm the research program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Centers um, in Newport, Oregon. And I will be your host for today. Um, we've talked about it a little bit, but your mics, cameras, and screen shares are turned off. If you can help us by keeping it that way for the duration of this event, it just helps overall. Um, but we would love for you to interact with us by using the chat uh, to ask your questions or to leave messages for uh, Robin as some of what you are doing now. Um, so if you are not familiar with Zoom, um, which my guess is most of you are, you can find that chat by going to the bottom or the top of your screen and clicking on the little call out button. Um, you'll get a pop-up box that you can chat to everybody. So feel free to do that at any time. Um, if it's a relevant question, we might jump into the um, presentation, but otherwise we'll get to those questions at the very end. I wanted to let you know that we are recording today's session. So if you miss something or you need to share it with somebody, um, you will be able to find it on the site that I just put into the chat box um, in a few days. And that is where all of our past seminars get posted. So if this event or any others you would like to see, you're welcome to go there. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was just promote next week's event. So um, on February 4th, already February, um, we have David Thompson from US Fish and Wildlife Service here at Hatfield going to be talking to us about lessons learned from a decade of applied um, restoration research. So his focus is primarily on estuary spaces um, and grasses around that. So it'll be a really um, different talk for us than what we've been talking about today, but really exciting and happy to have him join us. Um, if you are interested in any of our seminar events or any of our evening public events, you can go onto HMSC's um, website and go to the bottom of that landing page and you'll find our calendar of events. Um, but really why you're all here um, is for today's speaker. And so um, today's speaker was invited to us by our own Renee Albertson. So Renee, I'm gonna hand the mic off to you and you can introduce today's speaker. All right, thank you, Cinnamon. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Robin Baird. Robin obtained his PhD in biology from Simon Fraser University in 1994, studying the foraging ecology of killer whales. He was a postdoc fellow at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, where he continued to work with killer whales and also studied northern bottlenose whales. Since 1999, his primary focus has been a multi-species, multi-question study of Hawaiian adonises, using a variety of methods to elucidate population structure, habitat use, social organization, and behavior of beaked whales, kojids, and delphinids. He has authored or co-authored more than 130 peer-reviewed publications, two books, uh, Killer Whales of the World, is one and the other is the lives of Hawaii dolphins and whales, the natural history and conservation, and a number of book chapters. He lives in Olympia, Washington, where since 2003, he has worked as a research biologist with Cascadia Research Collective. He is also an affiliate faculty at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and Hawaii Pacific University and has been a member of the Committee of Scientific Advisors on Marine Mammals of the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission since 2011. Today, Robin is going to tell us about science and management of an endangered species, the false killer whales around the main Hawaiian islands. And with that, I will turn it over to Robin. Great, well, uh, thank you, Cinnamon. Thank you, Renee. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and to even though I can't see you guys, to see the names of a lot of, a lot of friends and colleagues uh, that are watching. So thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, just mention that the work that I'm going to be talking about is a long-term effort that really involves a lot of different people. We have a, a very hardworking and um, amazing people working in the field, working in the office, a lot of collaborators for this work. And we also get a lot of photographs from citizen scientists, folks who work on the water or play in the water and take photos of false killer whales and other species and, and contribute them to us. And 
it's been a uh, long-term project, so we've had funding from a lot of different sources, but uh, right now and recent years, uh, a lot of our false killer whale funding has come through a uh, state of Hawaii uh, contract through uh, NOAA Section 6 grant, also uh, funding from the Pacific Island Fishery Science Center and, and several other groups. So. Now, uh, most people, uh, if they look up false killer whales online, they uh, get a report that they, they were given their name because they look like killer whales. They don't actually look anything like killer whales. They were actually described from a subfossil skeleton and were given the, the name Sudorca because of similarities in the skull and the teeth uh, with killer whales. And that said, they do share a lot of features with killer whales. They're both long lived and slow to reproduce. False killer whale females probably first give birth around 10 years of age, uh, live into their 60s, uh, and their calving intervals are actually uh, lower than for killer whales. They're thought to give birth just once every six or seven years. They're also both uh, upper trophic level predators. False killer whales in Hawaii at least are feeding primarily on, on large game fish. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, uh, bottom left, a broad-billed swordfish, bottom right is an opa. Uh, upper right is a mahi-mahi and upper left is a, a ono or wahoo. Like most upper trophic level predators, they're naturally rare. Uh, and while they have a distribution that is, is global, uh, at least in the tropics and subtropics, they've never really been the subject of a lot of research, primarily because they're found uh, in open ocean waters rather than in, in coastal waters, although there's some, some, some exceptions as people are discovering in recent years. Now, I've actually been interested in false killer whales for, for a long time. Uh, 1987, when I was an undergraduate student, uh, worked with a couple other folks on the stranded whale and dolphin program in British Columbia. And, and one of our first strandings was a false killer whale. It turned out to be a first record of, of that species for Canada. So my second ever peer review publication and my fourth ever peer review publication were both on false killer whales. Uh, it wasn't until I moved to Hawaii, though, in, in 1999 that I really got to work on them on a regular basis. Uh, the work that I do there uh, typically involves going out in a small boat. This is one that we've used for many years uh, with a, a, a team of people going out on day trips. Now, over the years, our, our effort has really added up. We've uh, worked over 1,100 days on the water in, in the last 21 years. Uh, that work has involved surveys off of all of the main Hawaiian Islands, and each one of these little squiggly yellow lines represents uh, one day of, of search effort. Uh, you can see that the majority of our effort has been off the island of Hawaii. Um, we've worked there every year for the last 19 years, uh, and, and less effort off, off other islands. In most cases, our search effort is on the, the uh, leeward sides of the islands, the west and southwest sides of the islands but we typically have tried to expand our coverage as, as broad as possible whenever the weather allows to uh, get out as far offshore and, and cover uh, as much of the available habitat as possible. Now with uh, 11, over 1100 days on the water, uh, we've actually only encountered false killer whales on 93 days over this 21 year period. So uh, again, the, the information we've been able to learn um, has really come from multiple types of data, which I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, even though it's that works out to uh, one encounter every 13 days, in recent years we have learned that there are certain areas and certain times of the year where we have much greater success rates or much greater encounter rates. Our most recent project was was just in December. We we're on the water for 16 days and we encountered false killer whales for six of those days. So um, we can. Uh, if we, if we have targeted funding that allows us to focus just on false killer whales, uh, we, we have the ability to go places and at times where we can accomplish a lot more. Now I'm gonna show you this little video. Uh, it shows uh, two of our uh, main research techniques and uh, photo identification is obviously a, a big part of what we do. There's actually three different photographers on board the boat. Um, you can also see uh, Daniel Webster standing in the bow of the boat holding an air rifle uh, and this false killer whale, which is just uh, swimming underneath the boat, is going to surface on the other side and, and Daniel's going to deploy a tag. And so that gives you an idea of the, 
kinds of distances that we're able to remotely deploy these tags. This is one of the tags here, so you can get an idea of the size of it. Um, the other thing you can see in this video is that uh, on either side of the camera that's being used with the GoPro, there are these two green dot lasers. And those lasers uh, project two dots onto the dorsal fin of an animal that are exactly 15 centimeters apart. So we're able to use that to do some basic mor morphometrics, uh, the size of the dorsal fin, sometimes the size of the dorsal fin relative to the amount of back to the blowhole visible. And from that, we can start to characterize the, the age structure of the population. Now, the other uh, main technique that we've used over the years is uh, biopsy sampling. Uh, these biopsy samples have been used for a variety of different purposes, but um, population structure and genetics are certainly one of the most important ones. Uh, one of the uh, title of my talk is science and management, and, and the science itself has, has often uh, driven the management that's, that's been put into place with false killer whales. And the genetic example is, is the earliest and, and uh, one of the best ones. Uh, this is a paper that was published in 2007. Uh, that basically showed that uh, false killer whales around the main Hawaiian Islands appeared to be uh, genetically differentiated from false killer whales elsewhere. Uh, and in 2008, uh, in response to that, National Marine Fisheries Service basically recognized uh, that there was a separate insular population of false killer whales. This was also combined, uh, this was in the early years with our tag data, so we didn't really have much tag data at that stage, but it was combined with uh, long-term photo identification resightings. Uh, so that was the first recognition of, of both an insular and a pelagic stock, as well as, as uh, other stocks. Now that genetic work has continued to date. We now have a much larger sample size from Hawaii and, and uh, collaborators from around the world. Uh, and, and it's basically reinforced that uh, initial analysis that basically showed that there's um, just in, in the case of the main Hawaiian Island population, actually just two mitochondrial haplotypes uh, shared in that population that are very closely related. Uh, there is a Northwestern Hawaiian Island uh, population uh, that shares uh, one of those two mitochondrial haplotypes. Um, but uh, from uh, analyses of nuclear DNA, those two populations are, are largely reproductively isolated. So it's reinforced that earlier, earlier view. Now, in terms of tag data, these genetically differentiated populations uh, we know have, have overlapping ranges, but, but are largely using different areas. Uh, so this shows the satellite tracks from five different groups of pelagic false killer whales. Uh, this includes data from Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center and, and a couple tags we've deployed. The, the light blue outline is the Hawaiian exclusive economic zone, so the 200 nautical mile limit. And you can see that these individuals are, are ranging broadly both within Hawaiian waters and also into international waters. And that has a lot of implications for their overlap, for example, with, with international uh, pelagic longline fisheries. By comparison, uh, only four groups from the Northwestern Hawaiian Island population have been satellite tagged, but those individuals have shown an extremely limited uh, range of, of movements uh, ranging from Kauai in the Southeast to Gardner Pinnacles in the Northwestern Hawaiians in the, in the Northeast. Now, both pelagic and Northwestern Hawaiian Island false killer whales are, are um, encounters are, are few and far between. So sample sizes are quite small, uh, but we have tag data from 40 different groups from the main Hawaiian Island population now over the last 13 years. And, and these individuals have all shown an extremely restricted home range uh, that, that encompasses all of the main Hawaiian Islands and overlaps with those other two populations, uh, but have relatively limited movements offshore. The furthest offshore is just over 100 kilometers. Now, the main Hawaiian Island insular population um, was estimated to number um, over 450 individuals uh, in 1989 based on an aerial survey that was undertaken by uh, Steve Leatherwood and Randy Reeves. Uh, there were declining sighting rates in both aerial and boat-based surveys um, from the 1990s through the 2000s. And our first abundance estimate based on a mark recapture photo ID was uh, just 123 individuals, although uh, it was a fairly uh, imprecise estimate. Now, uh, this uh, information suggesting a population decline in a relatively small population led to a petition by um, 
the NRDC, Natural Resources Defence Council, to NOAA to list the population as endangered in 2010. Uh, NOAA undertook a status review and recognized it as a distinct population segment under the ESA. And then in 2012, the listing was finalized and, and that distinct population segment was listed as endangered. The most recent abundance estimate is about 167 individuals. Uh, it's a larger than our, our, our first abundance estimate, but uh, we don't really have any good trend information over the last uh, 15 or 20 years simply because of the uncertainty associated with the estimates. We've, we've certainly got a better uh, grasp of the, the uh, different social groups in the population, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Now, uh, this is a social network with each point representing an individual and the lines representing the links between those individuals. This is restricted to just uh, individuals that are seen three or more times and that have association indices between pairs that are that are um, 0.3 or greater. And what this reveals is uh, the existence of five different social clusters. This is another similarity to killer whales is that they uh, appear to live in long-term stable groups. Uh, we know from the genetic analyses that these individuals within these groups are, are um, strongly related, both males and females, that suggests that uh, there's little or no dispersal um, among these among these social groups, social clusters. Now, one of the other uh, main uses of the biopsy samples we've collected over the years and, and something that played a role in the uh, endangered listing uh, petition in, in 2010 and the listing in 2012 is the, the fact that these individuals have high levels of persistent organic pollutants. Uh, the first publication in 2009, um, we only had nine samples from this population and one third of those had PCB levels that exceed the uh, safe threshold that's uh, thought to affect immunosuppression in, in adenosine cetaceans. Now, uh, we've increased that sample size pretty dramatically um, and uh, broadened it out over in terms of increased uh, number of males and females and, and, uh, and a, a wider span of ages. And two thirds of all the individuals that we've sampled, including every adult male, have levels that exceed these um, health thresholds and more than half the adult females as well. So high levels of persistent organic pollutants um, uh, certainly could be a contributing factor to the, the uh, reduction in abundance uh, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Now, we've documented diet of these individuals uh, in a couple different ways. Working with Christy West from Strandings uh, has, has revealed the presence, for example, of a couple species of squid uh, that we've never uh, seen uh, in, in any of our observations. But they're active hunters during the day. They feed on large prey. They bring the prey up to the surface. And so we, we actually have a better idea of the diversity of prey of false killer whales and probably any other species of, of Adonis eaten Hawaiian waters. And what you can see from this list is that they're feeding uh, both on, on pelagic game fish, a number of different species of tunas, uh, as well as a number of reef associated uh, game fish, uh, trevallis. Uh, uh, this, this photo here shows a, a giant trevally, for example. Now it's one of the things about that list is almost everything on the list are species that are, are fished by humans. And um, it's that overlap in diet with humans that I think has led to the greatest uh, threat to this population. Uh, we know that fishery interactions have been ongoing since at least the 1960s. Uh, and it involves them depredating the catch. Uh, there was uh, Karen Pryor's book, Lads Before the Wind, which I'd highly recommend if, you, if, you're, if you've never read it. Um, in 1963, uh, had, she had someone go over to Kona and they went out on a long line vessel. They had originally reported that they had pilot whales taking fish off their long lines and, and um, they immediately found out that they were false killer whales. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Marine Mammal Commission report uh, reported that uh, behavior of depredating catch was very common uh, in Hawaii. So it's a behavior that's been occurring for a long time and, and, uh, and um, probably throughout all the main Hawaiian islands. Now, when we originally started uh, looking at evidence of fisheries interactions, the, the most obvious uh, fishery to us at the time was probably the Hawaii-based longline fishery. 
And that was because there was observers in that fishery uh, that had recorded false killer whale bycatch. False killer whales are caught in the fishery more frequently than any other species of cetacean. Um, but the fishery itself uh, was excluded from around the main Hawaiian Islands back in 1992, mainly due to overlap with, uh, with uh, nearshore fishermen and the competition with nearshore fishermen. So while that fishery incre increased pretty dramatically in the, the late 80s and early 90s, and it may have played a, a role in the, the early decline in the population, uh, unless the animals were going further offshore than they, they typically go now, uh, the interactions with the fishery seem to be relatively, relatively limited. That said, I am going to talk just for a couple minutes about this fishery because it's, it's even though individuals from the main Hawaiian Island population are probably not taken in the fishery very often, uh, what's being learned and, and efforts to try to reduce bycatch in this fishery, I think have some lessons for trying to figure out ways to reduce bycatch in the nearshore fisheries. So the bycatch in that fishery led to the formation of a take reduction team in 2010. And the team basically came up with a consensus take reduction plan. If you're not familiar, take reduction teams include fishermen, scientists, conservationists, and managers. And, and uh, the best case scenario is that they work cooperatively to come up with a consensus plan uh, because that's obviously going to have the greatest chance of, of success. Uh, the take reduction plan that the team uh, agreed on Sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Hopefully he, he'll discover that I'm upstairs. Um, and one of the main measures was uh, a combination of weak circle hooks. This is the, one of the primary hooks that's used in the fishery and strong terminal gear. Strong terminal gear being branch lines that in, in the regulations are, are at least two millimeters in diameter. And, and when you combine that with gear handling, which is in particular that fishermen, when they get a hooked false killer whale are supposed to put uh, tension on the line, then it has the potential to straighten the hook and uh, allow the animal to be released. So here's a, a hook, for example, uh, that actually has been bent that was brought back in from, from some large animal that, that straightened it out. Now, uh, this plan went into effect in, in 2013. And uh, what we know now, uh, after seven, eight years of, of uh, being in place, is that the plan is effectively not working. There's been no change in the serious injury and mortality rate. The interaction rates remain unchanged. Actually, the highest levels of bycatch were recorded uh, in 2018 and 2019. 2020 had a, a big reduction in effort due to, to uh, COVID. Uh, so it's not really clear how, how much that uh, high bycatch rate may persist. Uh, but the bottom line is the hooks aren't weak enough and the branch lines are not strong enough. Um, and additional training is needed with fishermen and crew to try to uh, encourage them to put tension on the line. Um, the other thing about this fishery is that, that the plan, because it relies on behavior of the fishermen to put tension on the gear, uh, is fatally flawed. Be there's only observers on 20% of the vessels. And so for those other 80% of the vessels, if, if they're just cutting the lines, you would get a, uh, a perceived reduction in the overall uh, bycatch rate. But in fact, uh, the actual uh, number of individuals that are bycaught could stay very high. So um, it's, it's been an interesting process and is, is really relevant to try and understand what to do uh, about nearshore fisheries. Uh, because this kind of gear fix in a, in a single type of fishery um, uh, obviously wasn't successful. So now that's the offshore longline fishery where there's 20% uh, observer coverage more or less. Um, there are uh, up to a couple thousand uh, commercial fishermen in nearshore waters that uh, with zero observer programs. And we do, uh, without observer program, it's obviously difficult to uh, know how often false killer whales might might get hooked, uh, but we do have a couple other lines of evidence that suggest that fishery interactions are occurring pretty regularly for this population. Now, one is uh, evidence of line injuries on the dorsal fin. This is a photo of a hooked false killer whale from the long line fishery, and the the vertical dark line that you can see on the animal is actually an abrasion, not not a shadow. Um, when an animal is hooked and the line is is tight. Uh, and they, they struggle against that gear, then there's a potential to uh, injure themselves in other areas. Uh, 
This was well illustrated in a uh, video taken by one of the observers. And this is just a still photo from the video. Um, but you can see if you look closely on the leading edge of the dorsal fin, uh, there's a linear cut through the leading edge of the dorsal fin. Uh, this is a, a, a pygmy sperm whale. Um, you can see the long line uh, coming from the mouth. And it, it just illustrates that when an animal is hooked in the mouth and struggles against that gear, you can get injuries on in other parts of the body that are a lot easier to document than, than uh, actually looking for mouth line injuries. So we did an analysis that was published a few years back that compared uh, injuries on the dorsal fin of individuals from the main Hawaiian Island population with the northwestern Hawaiian Island and pelagic population and individuals have a, a much higher, individuals from the main Hawaiian Island population have a much higher proportion uh, showing these types of line injuries, 9% of the individuals. Now it's possible that uh, individuals from uh, the pelagic population, uh, because of the heavier gear in, in the offshore longline fishery, uh, just have a lower survival rate uh, than, than individuals from the insular population, which are typically, I think, interacting with much lighter gear. Um, so there's, there's several things that could uh, be affecting that rate. Now, we also uh, wanted to uh, recognize that all we're looking at are the dorsal fins, which are a secondary indicator of how uh, often individuals might depredate catch and survive that depredation. So we've done an analysis looking at the mouth lines when we do have mouth line photos. And almost a quarter of the individuals that we have mouth line photos available where we can see at least 50% of the mouth line have injuries that are consistent with, with being hooked. And this is an example of one where uh, you can actually see uh, two broken teeth uh, and, and missing a fair amount of, of uh, gum tissue around it. Now, we also know that this uh, estimate of, of about a quarter of individuals that, that uh, have survived being hooked in the mouth uh, is an underestimate because the uh, individuals that have these injuries on average have a higher proportion of both the left and right hand side of the mouth line uh, visible than those that don't have any injuries. So uh, this is something in analysis that we're currently working to update with a much larger sample size of photos. So we, I think there's widespread, widespread recognition that solving any sort of depredation uh, issues or bycatch issues is going to require buy-in from fishermen. And uh, in various uh, meetings that have gone on to try to um, understand the, the nature and magnitude of this threat, um, fishermen have often been unwilling to acknowledge uh, that there is really a problem. And, and so uh, we have a, a paper that um, uh, is actually going to come out in the next week or two that, that tries to get at how, um, why this is. And, and the problem is, it, it seems like at many of these meetings, we, we've all been talking to the wrong fishermen. Uh, this is a map uh, showing the distribution of uh, catch uh, from these near shore fisheries. And these uh, grids of unequal size are the state of Hawaii commercial marine uh, license uh, fishery statistical areas. About a quarter of all the catch from these near shore fisheries occurs off the west coast of Hawaii Island, off of Kona. Um, but we know from our tag data that false killer whales spend relatively little time there, uh, less than 1%. So uh, the big question is how do you identify uh, which fish are most, most likely to be facing depredation and, and potential bycatch? Uh, this is the paper I mentioned that's going to be coming out shortly. Uh, we developed an a index of overlap between false killer whales and nearshore fisheries. And, we wanted to do this from the uh, to try to come up with something that re really would reflect the uh, perspective of the fishermen. Uh, we scaled all the index values to Kona, um, as it's the area with the greatest number of fishermen. It has the greatest amount of fishing effort. It has the greatest catch, and I, I think of Kona as an area where, when when fishermen in Hawaii uh, are going to go on vacation, they go to Kona uh, and fish there, and that's because the the uh, size of the island is such it creates a tremendous lee and, and makes for uh, very good calm waters for fishing. Uh, there's a, a, large, uh, a large charter industry there and, and there's quite a reputation for, for catching large billfish. So uh, I think if, if folks fish elsewhere in the islands, they can still uh, 
relate, they know lots of people who fish in Kona, they may have fished in Kona themselves, and they, uh, it's something that they can, can really relate to. So this fishery overlap index basically used the satellite tag data set that, that I've talked about a little bit and, and uh, used these same grid cells to come up with the total amount of time per unit area that our tag whales have spent in each of these areas and, and simply divided it by the number of days fished. Uh, we developed one for Kona and then we scaled all of the other fishery overlap indices to Kona. So effectively Kona would be a value of one and everything else is, is relevant, uh, relative to that. Uh, and from a fisherman's perspective, it, it should represent the likelihood of having false killer whales in their fishery zone, uh, which should be related to the likelihood of depredation and, and potentially bycatch. Now, uh, this shows the uh, fishery overlap index values, uh, uh, just color coded, um, and the scale here is uh, the number, uh, number of times a, a relation to Kona values. So, um, uh, you can see that there's certain areas off the north side of, of Molokai, north side of Hawaii Island, off the east side of Oahu, where the fishery overlap ind index values uh, range from over 100 to several thousand times higher uh, than they are off Kona, where most of the fishing occurs. And this is just another way of, of representing the same, um, same index values instead of in, in terms of relative to Kona, it's just uh, standard deviations above and below the mean. Uh, so you can see that it, it, it again reflects that there's some areas off of Eastern Oahu, north of Molokai, uh, north end of the Hawaii Island that are extremely high values. Now, uh, it, I think that uh, fishermen who've been coming to the meetings and have basically said that they rarely, if ever, interact with false killer whales were actually telling the truth. And it's mainly because most of the fishermen who've been coming to those meetings have been ones that spend most of their time fishing off Kona. Uh, so there's a large number of vessels off Kona. Uh, there's very rare false killer whale presence off Kona. And so those particular fishermen do have a, a low probability of, of either having false killer whales around or having them depredate. Uh, whereas areas off of eastern Oahu, uh, north of Molokai, north of Maui, and off the north end of Hawaii Island have values that range from the hundreds to the thousands of times uh, higher index values, which suggests that uh, a much greater chance, if you're an individual fisherman, of having false killer whales around you when you're, when you're bringing in catch. Now, we did this, this analysis looking at, at um, three different measures. We looked at a catch, we looked at a number of days fish, and we looked at a number of licenses and, and found the same trends uh, in each case. So what are the implications for identifying solutions? Well, obviously discussions with fishermen about uh, depredation and bycatch really needs to focus on those fishermen that actually have the, the most uh, experience with, the most probability of having interactions uh, so those that are fishing in those high overlap areas off of eastern Oahu, Penguin Bank, uh, Molokai, Maui, uh, north end of Hawaii Island. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not there should be some sort of observer program or electronic monitoring in, in these nearshore fisheries. Uh, and, and clearly, if, if, uh, if such monitoring was just distributed based on fishing effort, uh, you'd have a very low likelihood of ever documenting uh, any interactions if, if for example, a lot of the uh, monitoring effort was done off of Kona, and really it needs to be targeted to, to areas where the, the likelihood of documenting the interactions is relatively high. So uh, we also have uh, a lot of uh, ongoing or, or planned projects, which I'm just going to uh, briefly mention. A lot of this is driven by uh, trying to inform um, the draft recovery plan and, and actions that are identified in the recovery plan. Uh, we're collaborating with Southwest Fisheries Science Center on an epigenetic aging uh, project uh, to look at age structure of the population. And we also um, intend to use some of our photogrammetry to, to uh, look at, at age structure. Uh, we have some, some of the tags we've deployed are depth transmitting tags. So we're currently working on a manuscript on diving behavior. Uh, we're collaborating with Jeremy Kiska from Florida International University on a trophic ecology study using uh, stable isotopes from, from biopsy samples that we've collected from over, over 100 false killer whales, as well as uh, many other uh, species of Hawaiian Adonis eats. Uh, 
uh, a project with scripts looking at foraging behavior. Um, we're working with Christy West from uh, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology on a stress and, and reproductive hormone chemistry uh, project, again, using uh, biopsy samples from known individuals where we often have a lot of uh, information on, on the history of those individuals. And we know their sex, we know uh, at least uh, some, some other calving histories and so on. Um, I will mention, we, we also have been working uh, off and on uh, on a couple different ways for breath sampling to look at respiratory pathogens, uh, to uh, try to relate this to body condition and prior history. I'm gonna show a little video here that uh, shows uh, a drone-based uh, breath sampling uh, technique uh, that we've tried. Uh, this is a mother and calf oscular whale, and we basically have a petri dish mounted on the drone and, and can fly it through the exhaled plume. Um, and the idea of using a drone for breath sampling uh, rather than a uh, boat-based method is that there are certain individuals or times where we're not able to get close enough to individuals to use a pole-based method, so this should um, decrease the the biases associated with breast sampling probably would be uh, particularly valuable for individuals that are, are um, uh, moribund or in some way uh, diminished body condition uh, because those individuals are typically uh, difficult, very difficult to get close to. Uh, we're also using the drone to uh, look at, uh, at morphometrics, uh, in particular to uh, look at what factors might influence body condition, whether or not it's the uh, social cluster, the sex, the season, age class. Um, but importantly, we because for many of these individuals, we have evidence of prior fisheries interactions. And for some of them, we have levels of persistent organic pollutants uh, and calving history. Uh, we can look at all of how all of these factors may be uh, influencing body condition. One of the things I forgot to mention when I showed the uh, social network slide and the reason why I think that that's particularly important, um, again, going back to the, the killer whale analogy, uh, you think of southern resident killer whales that are listed as endangered and uh, with three different pods. And if you look at the trajectories of those three different pods over time, uh, the, the major decline in southern resident killer whales over the last uh, 25 years has really come largely from one of the three pods uh, declining dramatically from over 50 individuals to, to about 30 individuals. And so, you know, these different social clusters, we know they have different, uh, even though they all overlap in their ranges, uh, we know they have different uh, core areas that they spend their time. And so they're, they're basically subject to different types of of interactions with fisheries, different types of, uh, of environmental conditions, and um, looking at how all of these factors may vary by social clusters is really important going forward in terms of trying to understand what, uh, what factors might be influencing the, the population trajectory. Now, I also want to mention, because um, I think it's critically important that if bycatch is the greatest threat facing this problem or this population, then we need to uh, build relationships with fishermen. We need to um, learn from fishermen and, uh, and, and, and try to deal with some of the barriers that occur between fishermen and, and scientists. Uh, so over the years, we've been uh, trying to, to uh, provide additional information on our work to fishermen through a local magazine called Hawaii Fishing News, a number of different articles uh, that we've published over the years in that magazine. And uh, we've also uh, got a grant uh, last year to try to get fishermen who are interested in participating in the, the citizen science part of it to actually um, provide them with cameras on loan uh, and get photos back from them and use those uh, photos to uh, both pass information back to them but also in, in our science, whether they're used for estimating abundance or, or uh, understanding more about where the animals are spending their time. We, we've had fishermen in the past say that, um, you know, our abundance estimates uh, really don't hold a lot of weight. There are certain areas where they see lots of false killer whales. And so we, we basically are saying, okay, if you can get photos of those false killer whales, we can determine whether or not they're part of this insular population, whether there's some social group that we've just never documented before, uh, or uh, 
potentially even some other species that's difficult to distinguish from, from false killer whales. So it's, a, it's an ongoing effort and it's, and it's probably going to take a, a long time to, to, uh, to build those relationships to, to help move forward on, on these issues. Uh, so I also just want to mention that if you're interested in finding out more information on false killer whales or our work, uh, there's uh, a lot of resources available on our website and, and on social media. Um, and so uh, please, please contact us there. So um, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions and, um, and uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if, I don't know if it works for you guys. If someone has a question and it's not already written down, you could maybe turn your camera on and, and ask it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, going from, from any questions submitted would, would also be great. Let's start with questions in the chat box. Um, and then if somebody has trouble um, with that, then we'll, hi, Scott, do you have a question? Just nod your head if you do. OK, hang on just a second. All right, Scott, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thanks, Cinnamon. Thanks, Robin. Great, great overview of such a fascinating community of uh, false killer whales. So, Scott, you're muted again. Do you want to check your mic? Yeah. There you go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying thanks for a great, uh, great overview of such a fascinating community of, of uh, dolphins. Uh, and, and my question was about uh, the reports of fishermen shooting dolphins involved in depredation events, particularly, I mean, this was during the early 70s when it seemed like that was a fairly high uh, proportion of depredation by different species. And do you know if uh, that's ever been confirmed and what impact that may have had on the uh, false killer whale community, particularly there around Kona? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, one of the things that is, is interesting is, is whether or not the population has, as the population has declined, whether or not its range has shrunk as well, or at least its core area. And that's something that typically happens when populations decline. Uh, so I suspect that they were, well, both I suspect that they were much more uh, regularly seen off Kona in the past, and there's also evidence that they were much more regularly seen off Kona. Dan McSweeney, who started working there in, in the mid-1980s, said he used to see uh, false killer whales at much higher rates in the 80s and 90s than he did in, in the 2000s. Um, certainly, there are lots of reports of, of uh, fishermen shooting rough-toothed dolphins in Hawaii. Um, which depredate catch off Kona in particular pretty regularly. Um, I, uh, I don't know of any documentation for, um, for uh, shooting of false killer whales, but I will note that um, when they have, they, they get so many injuries that are um, from things like cookie cutter sharks, when those injuries reheal, they, they go back to the same background coloration um, and, and that happens fairly quickly. So unless, in terms of potentially documenting a gunshot individual from our photo ID work, you would have to, um, you would have to probably find an individual that was shot in the upper part of the dorsal fin where there's a, uh, and where you could get photos from both sides of the, sides of the fin uh, and see the different types of wounds. We had a wound um, that was a gunshot wound on a bottlenose dolphin uh, a couple of years ago that was uh, was documented because of the nature of the how recently the wound was after the animal had been shot and 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 the nature of both the entry and the exit wounds. But um, I think it probably occurs, but we just don't have any way of of saying how often. Okay, um, and we have a question that's come in on chat. Can you speak a little bit about the prospects of this population moving forward based on your work? Well. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, we, despite, well, I, I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, we have, we have, from our own work, we have an average of four encounters a year over the last 21 years. And, and even though we get a lot of photos from, from other folks, 
um, and that really allow us to come up with much better abundance estimates, for example, um, un unless there's more directed effort to uh, do a sort of a comprehensive uh, a splash level of, of, uh, of uh, directed research effort to try to come up with uh, large sample size for abundance. Uh, abundance estimates are always going to have a lot of uncertainty. So the population could be increasing, it could be decreasing, it could be staying stable, and, and we just don't have the power to to identify that. So I think that that's, uh, that's going to continue to be a, a limiting factor. Um, you know, I think that there's the potential to, uh, potential to look at healing of mouth line injuries, see whether individuals are still acquiring uh, evidence of fishery interactions. Um, one of the photos I showed earlier uh, had an individual with a very fresh dorsal fin injury from a line. Um, so we know that th these individuals are still acquiring injuries from fishery interactions, um, but you could in the long run use a declining rate of acquisition of new injuries to say that the, the fishery interactions are decreasing over time. Um, you know, it's, it's overall prospects. It's, it's funny, again, going back to the killer whale example, um, southern resident killer whale uh, numbers increased and increased and increased uh, for 25 years after uh, the population reached its lowest point, which was due to, to live captures for, for aquariums. Um, and then it started going down again. And, you know, I think that, uh, I think that you, you never really know what's going to happen in the environment, how uh, environmental factors are going to make it harder or not for, for the population to, to recover. Um, you know, it's, it's from the perspective of what they're feeding on, some of their prey species like yellowfin tuna, um, the yellowfin tuna, there's a lot less of them now and they're much smaller now than there were uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. But on the other hand, mahi-mahi, which they, they also feed on quite extensively uh, there's a lot more mahi mahi now than there were uh, 30 or 40 years ago, in part because those populations have uh, exploded in the absence of, of larger um, competitors like some of the tunas. So, you know, it's it's hard to uh, hard to weigh um, how that's all going to go. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty, um, but in in terms of biology and in terms of threats. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be any quick or easy solution to to the problems that they're facing. So, um, and go ahead and keep putting your questions in the chat box or pop up on the screen, and I can unmute you. Um, but in the meantime, I have a question for you, Robin. Um, and you alluded to this a little bit at the end, and it might not be something you can speak to because you don't have that long database like we do with the killer whales up in Puget Sound. Um, but you were talking about body condition, and that was something that we talked about in our seminar last week. And so I was wondering, you talked primarily about fishing interactions, but are you seeing any change in the population's body condition? Uh, and can you even speak to that with, that, with the data that you have? Our, our, our sample size from, from drone footage is, is limited, so we can't, can't say anything about that now. Um, I will say, though, that uh, at least in some social clusters, um, when we see calves, uh, we, so we just had a field project in, in um, in December, with a, and we encountered this one social cluster, cluster four, on five of, five of the six days, and, and calves in cluster four seem to be um, incredibly robust. Um, you know, they they have fat rolls visible on the backs. There, so so I I think that I think body condition will show that um, at least for that cluster, those calves are doing really well. Uh, and I think where it will get interesting will be a comparison of body condition uh, among social clusters. Again, you could have, you know, it's it's a it's the problem with with small anecdotes is that you know we could say, oh, based on based on on these observations in cluster four, they're probably doing great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one of the one or one or more of the other social clusters are maybe feeding on different things and and uh, and um, and species that are either harder to catch or reduce numbers. So the, the trophic ecology project with 
with Jeremy Kiska will be interesting because we have enough samples from from different social clusters to get at least a broad idea of whether or not there may be uh, trophic differences uh, among the, the social clusters. Yeah, I was wondering about um, the, the drivers of the spatial distribution of the different clusters and whether you know enough about them um, to see if that was changing or whether that was being driven, their social um, or their distribution was changing over time as well. Yeah, we know for, for for our satellite tagging, um, over half of all of our tag deployments have been on cluster one. Um, and and it's just because cluster, well, cluster one tends to be found in shallower water um, than the other clusters. And so that we, we've had a higher encounter rate with them overall. Um, and uh, they also range, uh, as far as we know, they they have the broadest range of any of the social clusters. So that some, Another reason why we've we've tagged cluster one off of Kauai, Oahu, uh, Maui, and and Hawaii Island, whereas most of the other clusters tend to have much more restricted ranges. Um, uh, and and sorry, I got I got sidetracked because uh, what? So so we 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 know that the cluster clusters vary in their in their distribution, um, but what drives that variation is it's hard to say. Yeah, that's where I was going with, with cluster one is, so we know with cluster one, which we have the largest sample size, that they do show seasonal variation in their spatial use. And we, we don't have large enough sample sizes from the other clusters to really document whether there's seasonal variation. But if there's seasonal variation, it has to be driven by some sort of environmental factor. And, and so if we can get at what, what that environmental factor is, then that'll uh, give us a better understanding of, at least on a broad scale, what may be driving their their spatial use. Um, I, I I think of of again going back to southern resident killer whales. It's nice to have a, a population that's been studied intensively since 1975. Um, you know the three the three pods of southern resident killer whales uh, have overlapping ranges, but but there are quite strong differences both at a small scale and a large scale with with where they spend um, where they spend their time, and um, again, you know why that is is hard to say. Other than I think that a lot of it comes down to these highly social autonomous seats actually to be cultural traditions. You know they they um, they interact with each other, but they basically um, divide up their their habitat to some degree based on these social lineages. Interesting. Yeah, it's been really um, good for me to have the, our two seminars back to back where we had the killer whale talk um, uh, literally last week and to be able to compare what we have with such a rich, long um, baseline data set in comparison to what you've been talking about and just the, the limitations of that. So, well, I should say um, we were really lucky, uh, even though our catalog started around 1999-2000, uh, Dan McSweeney, who I mentioned earlier had been um, working off of Kona since the mid eighties um, had had taken, he's one of the few researchers in Hawaii in the eighties and nineties that um, took photos of a lot of different species. So he, uh, he provided all of those photos and it immediately uh, increased our, our catalog going back um, to, to about 1985. That said, uh, as, as I mentioned, the different social clusters show different preferences for different islands. So there's one cluster, cluster four, which I'm not sure if he had any early encounters with cluster four because almost all of their time is spent off of uh, Lanai and Maui and Molokai. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it definitely works out much better when, when anyone who's out in the water um, is getting photos throughout the islands because of these cluster specific spatial use patterns. Wow, interesting. All right. The question box has been a little quiet, so I'm going to assume that folks have got what they needed. Scott's coming back on. Did you have another question for us, Scott? Sure. If we have another minute or two, what, what do you think distinguishes the insular populations or communities from these more pelagic or offshore ones? I mean, your your satellite tagging suggested that they spend there's quite a lot of overlap, although they're more widely distributed. They overlap considerably with the more 
um, island associated populations. But this is a kind of a fascinating topic as you know, as you know, and Renee knows uh, that uh, other species of, of adonocetes develop these island specific populations, other pelagic adonocetes develop these island specific uh, communities. What drives that? Well, um, I mean, and then there's 11 different species of adonocetes in Hawaii that have insular populations, uh, uh, including uh, three different families, cogids, beaked whales, and, and delphinids. Um, and uh, one of the things that we know about false killer whales that differs from at least the other, uh, other delphinids in Hawaii that have these resident insular populations is that um, individuals from this population are all part of the same maternal lineage. So there was probably a, a single colonization event um, of, false, of false killer whales at some point in the far distance, distant past that then uh, led to both the main Hawaiian Island insular population and the Northwestern Hawaiian Island insular population. Having the Northwestern Hawaiian Island population there as well is interesting. Um, it, Karen Martin's 2014 uh, paper showed that there was more um, genetic interchange between pelagic and Northwestern Hawaiian Island animals than there is between Northwestern Hawaiian Island and Main Hawaiian Island or between Main Hawaiian Island and Pelagic. And I think that that relates to the different ecological situation in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands compared to the Main Hawaiian Islands. Uh, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, uh, it's a, a fairly productive area in uh, a field of surrounding pelagic waters that are also reasonably productive, at least seasonally as the, um, as the uh, uh, seasonal uh, changes in the subtropical convergence zone. Um, and, and so I think, whereas in the main Hawaiian Islands, it's really a small oasis in the middle of this oligotrophic desert. And, um, and so I think that wildly speculating at some point in the distant past, some, some pelagic false killer whales uh, came across the main Hawaiian Islands and, and found this uh, increase in productivity around the main Hawaiian Islands and decided to stay and, and, and eventually spread to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And then the isolation between the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and, and main Hawaiian Islands population uh, probably er originated in the same way that the Northern and Southern resident killer whale communities did where you got individuals that are just, uh, you know, they've got a home range that's large enough um, for them to do well and, and uh, over time either drift or, or some sort of territoriality, which I know isn't really necessarily a thing with, with the Donacids, but um, it led to the split of those populations. You know, the fact that it's occurred with all of these other species in the main Hawaiian Islands, I mean, the, the 11 species of Adonisids that I mentioned, those are species that are resident to Hawaii Island, um, Pilot whales, false killer whales, melon headed whales, pygmy killer whales, rough toothed dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, spinner dolphins, spotted dolphins, dwarf sperm whales, Blainville speaked whales, Cuvier speaked whales. I mean, it's a, it's a long list of, of resident species. And I think that those multiple species all um, following, even though in the case of those other species, you know, we know that it's not a single colonization event um, based on the mitochondrial diversity of, of those resident animals, but we, we know that um, those, in, those, those environmental differences between that near shore oasis and the, and the oligotrophic offshore waters is I think what, what's, which caused them to, to, to stay. Well, I'm conscious of our time. So I just want to thank everybody who was online. Um, hopefully you'll join us again next week or sometime in the future. Also wanna thank Renee for inviting today's speaker. Um, it was really great to have you. And of course, thank you very much, Robin, for speaking with us. Um, everybody that's still online, you are welcome to unmute if you would like and just say thank you um, or throw it in the chat. But um, I know that I am just really happy that you were able to share with us and it is coming in on the chat right now. Everybody's saying thank you very much and thanks for joining us. Um, so everybody else, uh, thanks and hopefully we'll see you next week. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Robin, it was great to see you. Thank you. Take care everyone. Thanks Robin. Wear a mask. <laughs>
<laughs> Public information uh, commercial happening at the end of seminar. <laughs> Perfect. All right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to go ahead and end the presentation now. Thanks.